welcome uh, friends and colleagues to today's installment, June 9th, 2020, of Reporting and COVID-19 Conversations for Journalists, a, a series of discussions sponsored by the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, a project of Columbia Journalism School devoted to uh, effective, ethical, and innovative reporting on violence, conflict, tragedy, and all things traumatic around the world. Uh, the series is also co-sponsored by our friends at, at Columbia Journalism Review. This is, uh, as the title implies, not always narrowly focused on COVID-19. It's reporting and COVID-19, with all that implied, um, designed to strengthen our toolkit, our thinking, our imaginations as journalists. I am pleased and honored to be joined today by my uh, colleague, Linda Freed, who's the Dean of the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Um, and I'll say a bit more about her in a minute, but we're also speaking today in an extraordinary moment. And I wanted to frame this conversation in that way. Um, when uh, Dean Freed and I first discussed doing this kind of a, of, of a conversation. I think we both were thinking we would focus relatively narrowly on reporting and aging issues, which is her own specialty in public health, um, in this pandemic period in which aging, loneliness, nursing homes, and all of that are so central to how it's playing out around the world. But a couple of things have happened since then. One is that um, in the US and around the world, we're moving into various iterations of the, the recovery phase of the pandemic, which has exposed some glaring chasms in our public health systems here in this country and, and in others. And at the same time, um, we have had the police murder of George Floyd and the wave of protests around the world in the wake of that. We're speaking today on the day that George Floyd is being buried in Houston. And I think that moves the center of gravity, while we'll touch on all of these things, to, to the question of health justice, which all of us as journalists are deeply engaged with, and which is, I think, at, at the heart of Dean Freed's own commitments and work. So, you know, we will um, talk about public health and what this phase of the pandemic reveals. We'll talk about some aging specific issues and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Uh, for those of you who are new to these uh, DART Center webinars, the way it works is that uh, Deedon Fried and I will talk for 20, 25 minutes or so. And then we'll start taking your questions using the Zoom chat, which will prevent us from having any bandwidth issues or other problems and will allow us to strategically consolidate related questions. Um, you can certainly start sending those chat questions in while we speak, um, but then maybe move into a, a, a broader um, a broader engagement a little bit later in the talk. Let me introduce you first of all to Dean Fried. And I see on this talk on, on the participant list there are journalists from uh, India, from the Mideast, from Puerto Rico, from uh, all over the world. So this should be a really rich conversation. Um, Linda Freed, MD, uh, MPH, is the Dean of Columbia's Mammon School of Public Health since 2008. She's a leader in the fields of epidemiology and geriatric medicine. She and I first met through a program that we run every year, Columbia, every year at the Columbia Journalism School called the Age Boom Academy. Trained in cardiovascular and chronic disease epidemiology, she's dedicated her career to the science of healthy aging and creating a health span that matches our increased life expectancy, prevention of frailty, disability, and cardiovascular disease, and defining how to transition to a world where greater longevity benefits people of all ages. Um, there's so much to say about Linda's work and the many, many awards that she's won. I, I think, you know, among my favorites, she's been named in the top one percent of uh, top one percent of scientists in the world by Reuters, uh, and that's that's a, a wonderful uh, recognition. She's also been declared what was it a 
a treasure of science or something in 2004, I think was, was the award, something like that. But we're, we have here to talk with us as journalists, someone who's been thinking for a very long time about these issues. Um, Linda, I want to start by talking a little bit about public health and where we are right now. You, you did a piece in the, uh, in the Hill a couple of days ago, an op-ed, in which you said essentially, I think if my memory is right, um, we are reaping what we have not sown. You talked about the decline of investment in public health and how it's been up to this loose confederation of uh, voluntary sectors, universities, agencies, foundations, to try to respond where government could have stepped in. What do you see as the, in, as we go forward, the fundamental public health challenge that this country and maybe others as well are facing right now? How, is, how has COVID-19 challenged our public health capacity? So first of all, uh, Bruce, thank you for having me here and hello to everybody on, on this call. Um, I appreciate um, so much interest in the and, and dedication among everybody to reporting in the, for the public interest. Um, you know, I think the what we have ended up with in the has really been a chronic set of problems which have been um, led us to have inadequate public health system resources in the face of a pandemic that the likes of which we haven't seen in a hundred years. And it takes, uh, as you well know from all the reporting that you do, it takes a catastrophe to sometimes uh, reveal the underlying weaknesses in the system. And the weaknesses in the system have been great and quite frankly, they've been compounded by, weak by weaknesses in leadership. But um, the weaknesses in the system uh, are all of our laws. So the, the US public health system is probably the, the best kept secret of what we all need to know that I know of. <laughs> so um, I mean, public health is a relatively new field. It's, it, it emerged with, with medicine um, medical science in the early 1900s with an understanding that actually diseases could be preventable. Mm -hmm. And um, public health schools, in fact, emerged out of that with a mandate to create the knowledge as to how to prevent them, which is what we do every single day. But, um, and then out of that grew the need to organize the public responses to affect the prevention of diseases and disability and injury through a public health system because many things that are preventable have to be prevented at the level of all of us. Yeah. Can't be prevented one person at a time and a pandemic is a perfect example of that. Um, so how do you do that? Well, the US organized a very elegant system of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the national level state and local and um, tribal and territorial health departments, which in, a co in theory in a coordinated and complementary set of fashions have shared responsibility for protecting everyone's health in the face of disasters, in the face of how to build health for everybody and are responsible for preventing the spread of infectious diseases in particular. The challenge in this pandemic has been what's been revealed is that the U.S. has basically disinvested in its public health system since the 1960s. And I can say that in terms of U.S. dollars because we have looked at that as have other people. And basically uh, only 2.5% only of U.S. health dollars go into the U.S. public health system. The rest goes into medical care. Well, the evidence would suggest that actually 70% of a population's health comes from public health and 
less than 20% from the right medical care. So we're investing in opposite from what we need and we've starved the public health system so that it doesn't, it's basically $4.5 billion short of what it needs to deliver health to the US public and at least several hundred thousand uh, professionals short to deliver the kind of action that was needed in this pandemic. And, you know, and I, and I think while public health systems vary a lot around the world, there's certainly for a generation now has been that kind of downward pressure on social safety nets and, and, mm -hmm. and disinvestment in many countries. Um, if I were a local reporter, let's say in New Orleans or in Bangalore uh, or in Dublin, and if I were trying to assess how my own city or state or region's public health system has met the coronavirus challenge, and if I was trying to document some of the concerns that you raise, what would be the key indicators? What would be places I would want to begin digging in for evidence of disinvestment or evidence of success? Well, if you're talking about metrics of su success from the pandemic itself, mm -hmm. then there are certainly countries that have responded with alacrity and unified yeah. action and, and leadership that has helped everybody get on board to mm -hmm. be part of the solution. But what, uh, but what, about, what about indicators of longer term capacity? I mean, there's the kind of the immediate response where leadership has mattered, but then there's the actually how are we really doing question. <laughs> right, right. Well, in the short term, the measure of whether the disease has been shut down or has spread is, is one clear metric of that ability. Right. And uh, the U.S. has done dismally on that, and there's been high variation between countries. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at you know, there, there are lots of metrics in the world. Certainly the OECD countries have metrics about the health status of a population. Mm -hmm. And um, from a U.S. centric point of view, the U.S. has dropped in the last 25 years from having among the best health status for everybody to the worst among pure nations, 36 pure nations. So those metrics are telling. Um, they include a wide variety of issues that are sentinel markers of the general health of a population. Mm -hmm. And and as I said, about 70%, 75% of the general health of population comes from public health approaches. In different countries, they're led by different parts of government, parts of agencies, but generally this is an important governmental function for leadership. Mm -hmm because it truly meets the definition of a public good. Yeah, so if I'm trying to look, and again, let me just take New Orleans as a random example, with apologies to any reporters from New Orleans who may be on this call. Um, if I'm looking to see how prepared New Orleans or the state of Louisiana are for the next phase, and I'm looking for some public health data that's suggestive of our capacity, what are some very specific topics I might be looking at that can help me help me understand it? Well, the, from the outside, and, and, and understand that I don't sit in the health department. Right. And people who have health commissioners would probably give you other metrics than the ones that I'm going to name. But, but I think a, general, a city's gen or a state or a region's general health status is a very important marker of how susceptible the population is going to be when a new, a new infectious agent rolls through. Right. Um, so we have seen that in, in many cities. I, I imagine New Orleans has seen it, certainly New York has, where it's the people with the communities, usually of people who are poor, who have had less access, less protection from public health, less access to medical care, less access to the conditions that create health, and there's a high degree of chronic disease. And those are the communities in which COVID has been particularly destructive in, in this pandemic. And so the, the 
the background health status mat matters greatly in terms of whether people can be resilient to the next pandemic. The second thing is just whether a health department, and, and here I'm not talking about medical care delivery systems because medical care delivery systems, except in a few countries, uh, are focused on the patients who they take care of. They're not focused on the population, they're not able to, nor necessarily should they be focused on the, the conditions in the whole population um, that's, nor do they have the remit to change those conditions in terms of whether they affect health. Nor do they have the data in general, although some countries do it in their medical care system, to understand what's going on in that population. And so public health systems that have data collection abilities mm -hmm. that are sophisticated mm -hmm. and can track health and disease in a population and understand most at risk communities and target solutions to them are mm -hmm. very important. So how's our data? Is it actually a really important it's a test? Big deal. It's a big deal. And we've been, you know, where we have it, we've been relying on it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, interestingly in New York City, there is not much data by community and by who's at risk. Shockingly, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would be very important to em empower a health department to be able to target at-risk communities to protect them. Mm -hmm. But in general, the other level of data is the data of, you know, kind of moment to moment um, uh, where the disease is, if you're talking about a pandemic, right. um, so that early in the disease, the health department can spring into action you know, um, diseases are reportable, you know, certainly in the U.S. Certain, mm -hmm. certain infectious diseases, um, clinicians who identify them have to report them to the health department um, by law. And then the health department springs into action and goes out and finds the person with the illness. And in the case of an infectious disease, then does what you keep hearing about in terms of contact tracing and finds the people who they have um, potentially infected or were infected by to understand the chain of tr transmission and keep it from expanding. So, so assessing the quality of infectious disease data from past more routine um, mm -hmm. medical events could be a way of understanding whether your community or region is up to snuff or if they need some additional investment in that area and that's absolutely. certain you know absolutely and that's the um the data i mean there's a lot of reporting uh going on which is quite admirable on scientists who are doing modeling using those kinds of data to understand how, how the infection is spreading what's going to happen next predicting whether it's going to rise or fall, understanding the conditions that may be mitigating it, and then helping us through data to understand uh, where there are flare-ups, where there might be a second wave, how do we catch it quickly, how do we contain it, and then how do we use all of that knowledge to figure out when we can come out of lockdown. <laughs> Yeah, and there may and, and you know there may be ways that data journalists who are very skilled at scraping can use some of this same data to ask other capacity questions and accountability questions that are going to be a little bit different and 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 more journalistic. Um, let me shift a little bit since our our time is limited and focus specifically on the public health issues related to aging. I mean, I think everyone now understands that the very old have unique vulnerabilities in this pandemic um, that around the world, nursing homes and care facilities have, have become charnel houses. Um, there's real tragedy. What do you see as the core issues that we can address and attend to in public health that affect the elderly in the next stages we've what has happened has happened but a how can we better protect our aging populations in the next phases and b what are some 
key effects on the elderly that we may not have been attending to while we're counting corpses, frankly. So there are, not, there are several issues to focus on, I think. One is that we have always known that people who are harbored in close quarters are particularly at risk when there's an infectious agent coming through which nobody's been exposed to before, mm -hmm. right? Um, nursing homes, prisons, dormitories, um, military barracks, they're the classic places where people are highly at risk. And so you need particular uh, public health approaches to protect people, to recognize the risk and to protect people in those settings. Um, it's one of the reasons why vex, you know, people who run nursing homes, uh, for example, when there is a vaccine, um, pay particular attention to vaccinating people to protect them, right? Like with influenza vaccine. Uh, the challenge, of course, is when um, there's a, uh, a virus like this one that nobody's seen before and we don't have a vaccine. Yeah. And the additional challenge for older people comes from a combination of increasing risk of multiple chronic diseases, which um, affect their health, and uh, something I've spent a lot of years trying to understand, which is an underlying change in their in physiology as people age, which leads to a condition we call frailty, mm -hmm. and makes them less able to bounce back. Mm -hmm. um, independent of the diseases, and that makes people particularly vulnerable. Um, and then there's a third issue, which is that the disease, um, my colleagues who are clinically active now are telling me that the disease manifests differently, as, as happens often in diseases as people get older, and um, has some particular twists. You and I have also talked a little bit about some of the collateral effects Right. of the pandemic and social distancing, including particularly loneliness. And I think this is an underreported area from a journalist standpoint. Talk a little bit about how, how and why we should be attending to this. Sure. So I think, first of all, it's important to say that um, a background issue is that the U.S. and actually increasingly the whole world have increasing rates of loneliness in, in old people, but also in young people. This is um, a consequence of many things in society, I think, which we don't have the time to go into. But then you put um, everybody in lockdown, <laughs> in isolation, in either their apartment or their nursing home or a retirement community, um, and you enforce uh, social isolation in a world um, actually with high risk of loneliness anyway. Mm -hmm. And you have, um, you know, real, really difficult conditions for people. Um, I, I will say that um, in a class I taught last semester at Columbia for undergraduates and public health graduate students in the face of the pandemic and, and students having to leave their dormitories abruptly yeah. in March to protect their safety, yeah. Yeah. we created an uh, on-the-spot intervention of matching students with older adults in the community and they had to mm -hmm. talk twice a week with the thought mm -hmm. that both were at risk of loneliness in this pandemic. So a true intergenerational approach. Right. So we set yeah. up dyads who had to talk twice a week and, and um, the students found it, the, the whole experience of the pandemic as um, isolating and loneliness producing as the older adults. And they all benefited from having the opportunity for uh, this kind of connection and learning from each other and hearing from each other. Mm -hmm. So the loneliness is hard, is very high. I, I mean, and I think everybody's feeling it. I mean, I've heard from so many families where they're in pain because they can't go and visit their grandmother or their yeah. great grandmother. And, and so the pain is mutual. And it suggests, uh, you know, again, like talking about the public health system that we have some, pre-existing conditions which get worse mm 
-hmm. in this context to a severity that is not acceptable for people's well-being. And we need to learn from this how to build back better after this because people hurt from this kind of loneliness and isolation. So, so looking, again, if one were a local or regional journalist, looking both at the experience of loneliness, but also at perhaps efforts to combat it that are intergenerational and come, enforce making connections, um, aren't, they aren't just about making people feel better in an abstract way. There's a, a real health impact Absolutely. to addressing that. People, I mean, it is the most human of needs to have feel connection with others that where you feel like uh, uh, your emotional needs are met in that those interactions. Um, but it goes well beyond that. Um, there are lots of kinds of loneliness. One is to, for meaningful connection with family and friends. Mm -hmm. Another is a kind of loneliness of uh, of whether you are seen and valued in society and whether you have a role in the pub and to contributing to the public good through anything could through your building, your block association, your, your neighborhood association, your church, something that has a higher calling than just survival. Is there, is there a kind of messaging that you think community leaders, political leaders should be doing around loneliness and validating the value of the old right now. I mean, I, you know, I've been struck by in this country and in some others, the kind of essentially the mass write-off of yeah. vulnerable old people. Do you think there's an argument for, for another way? Absolutely. Um, what we are doing is a manifest in many ways is a manifestation of ageism. It's an assumption that old people have no value and we can just, we, we can't afford them. Yeah. Uh, that's the narrative that has been going on in this country since the 80s uh, that I've noticed. And I, and I would say the opposite is the case. Um, I'll just quote from some of the students who wrote their final reports from their um, twice a week discussions with older people. And what the students learned was that and they said this repeatedly in their papers, that the older adults brought for them a perspective that we will survive this. Mm -hmm. They brought a wisdom about how to handle it. And they brought a concern for the public good that they were contributing to by staying home because they understood that by staying home, they, not only were they protecting their own health, but if they got sick, they were protecting their community's health by not going out. And, and that elevated the mood of the young people. Mm. But be, so, so older people have a, we need those intergenerational contributions where every age has something to contribute, mm -hmm. but we need older people. We have assets in our older population that the world never saw before. Yeah. We have never had older people before in this way. And they have a huge amount to contribute. I, and I, I think there's an argument for journalism playing a role in this. And I, I haven't seen enough of it, of reporters recognizing the presence of elders in their community at this time and elevating and validating their engagement, their presence. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. Let me ask you one other question about aging and then maybe we'll go to some questions from the chat. So folks begin typing in your questions for Linda Freed. Um, I, as I've watched the, the deaths tear through nursing homes, including here in New Haven, Connecticut, where I'm speaking from um, around this country and, and around the world. I have found myself wondering if there's an argument for reinventing nursing care. If all of these deaths mm -hmm. are an indicator of something fundamentally wrong in how we're approaching that. It, is there anyone doing work on that? Is that something that you, you think is worth touching on right now? So there's, there's a lot of experiments going around on in the US um, uh, on top of a lot of trends. The trends have been um, that there are not that many nursing home beds. And so there have been lots of other models developing over the years uh, for people who need some kind of supportive um, environment, but don't need 
clinical care. Right. Um, but on top of that, I think this does raise the question of whether we need to design, when nursing homes are needed, yeah. which, uh, whether we need to design them differently, mm -hmm. whether we need to also think ab about really putting weight behind um, the approaches in an emergency like mm -hmm. this so that people are protected. But part of the protection has to be what you were saying, protecting people from being lonely till the end of their lives because they are locked in their room. It, are there any interesting examples of innovations in nursing care that reporters might attend to for people who do need clinical yeah. residence? So there have been um, some interesting um, approaches to actually introducing technology uh, for, for residents of nursing homes so that they can stay connected in better mm -hmm. ways to people they love. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that is not high tech, that's normal tech in our lives yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, but there's good data to show that it makes a really big difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it actually makes me wonder, are, are there any projects at this time with people uh, putting technology in the hands of elders who need it and making sure that they can easily access Zoom and things like that. There's a learning curve that's tough. There's a, an equipment curve that's tough. Is there anyone who has responded in interesting ways to the pandemic that way? So there are a lot of people who are working on it. Um, no one name leaps to mind, but you know, someone who's uh, a deep authority on the use of technology to decrease loneliness and increase social support is Sarah Saja okay. at Cornell. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, we can maybe Ariel can track that down and share that, share that in the chat. Um, let's let's go to questions, folks. Start, please, um, just typing them into the chat. Um, Susan Kaplan, who works with the Dart Center and is assembling a kind of running tip sheet from all of our Zoominars here uh, the last few weeks, is wondering if health departments should be producing campaigns uh, to ad do, do public health campaigns that governments and others um, advance, should they be aiming to educate and promote critical practices on health care, critical approaches? Like, what, what should the messaging be right now? I guess that's behind Sue's question. So I, I see reference to smoking. Um, mm -hmm or proactive testing? And the answer is absolutely. That's a core function of health, de the health departments are mandated to do in the US at least. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and there, are two, there are multiple dimensions to making that successful. One is effective communication and media campaigns. Mm -hmm. And the other is creating the conditions to make it possible to fulfill the recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, one of, um, because of lack of resources, mm -hmm. um, the, in general, I think health departments in the US, there are some exceptions, have not mounted, been able to mount the level of testing of people who were asymptomatic or yeah. with mild symptoms that we needed. Instead, all the testing went for, for almost two months. Yes. to people who were seriously ill. Right, so, so, we did, so there's a lot that we didn't learn. Yeah. <laughs> right, so ba I think a lot of basic public health knowledge and, and expertise was sidelined. Mm -hmm. um, health departments know that these are critical functions. So you need both communication and you need to create access to the conditions that make uh, following through easy and possible. Mm -hmm. um, Jill has an interesting question from Brazil that the average age of people dying from COVID-19 in Brazil seems lower than other countries and nursing homes are not so common there because families, more aging care happens in families. Could these two things be related? So one of the, um, it's possible. I, I don't know the data, but certainly 
the way that the disease is spreading the most in communities in the U.S. is in families who, where there are a lot of people in, in shared housing uh, tightly packed together. Mm -hmm. And often people who are living in those circumstances also have a lot of underlying health problems, which makes mm -hmm. them particularly vulnerable. Uh, and they have less access to medical care when they're sick, which, which um, can lead to much worse health outcomes. And less public health to, to help with some things that we know work. Like if, you, if you're living in a house with 10, 15, 20 people and everybody's tightly packed together and one person gets sick, one of the approaches in, that works is to create housing for the, that ill person so that they can be cared for elsewhere and not get the other 15 people sick. Um, Ellen has an interesting question. Ellen Pillagian, um, what's caused this shift toward age segregation and a, away from respect for elders that you mentioned? You, you, mm -hmm. You, 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 this is a historical question for some of us old enough to remember, but you, you marked the 1980s as a period that saw the rise in some of the ageism you're discussing and some of the disinvestment. Take us through a little of the history. How did we get here? So there, there are kind of uh, layers upon layers of what's happened, but, but some of it is um, the rise of the nuclear family um, and I'm not faulting that, <laughs> but, but what, it, what it's done is it's separated older people from the central family and, and led to less importance for them. Now, many older people love that. Uh, so <laughs> there, there are pros and cons of both dimensions, but, um, but the role in the family in many places has been weakened. Families are living in different cities. Um, that connection has been weakened. And then our society has over, I mean, this is not my work, I'm quoting other people, but over the last hundred years has moved to valuing people who have roles based on profession, job, and expertise. And a diminished identification and valuation of other identities that you have, other values that you have just as a whole person. And so when people retire, they lose the only identity that society values. Mm -hmm. And it creates invisibility. And on top of that, human beings don't like death and dying, particularly in the United States. We have a lot of trouble with that. I'm being glib, but serious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, what ha and we have never before experienced that as people age, they can have health, they can have vitality, they can be engaged, they have a lot of uh, a lot to contribute. We never had that before. So we've tied our understanding of aging to our own fears of decrepitude and death and mix that in a pretty toxic brew that turns out from a health and well-being point of view to be as toxic as racism and sexism for the well-being of older people. And then on top of that, in the 80s, we um, really, Ronald Reagan created a political narrative that he labeled gre greedy geezers. So greedy geezers were old people who were stealing resources from the young through um, taking social security. And of course, the, of course this was never, it, these are people who didn't exist, but they became the reigning political myth of that era. That's yeah. right. And then we, I think we have a, a problematic political equation, um, which is an either or one, that we mm -hmm. either put, give resources, the narrative goes, to my mind, we either give resources to older people or to kids, and we have to choose. Mm -hmm. Well, the truth is, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to choose. And in fact, by investing in one, the other always does better. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, just because I want to make sure we get a couple of these other questions because they're fascinating. Um, Ruba uh, points out that back in 1993, which is now quite a few years ago, Betty Friedan wrote her book Fountain of Age and talked about gender bias. And Ruba's wondering, is, is data and research on aging still gender biased? Or has there been some progress in that? I think there's been some progress. I, I think the, 
Um, I think the research is less gender biased. I think our policies still have immense gender bias in them. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the highly at risk group of older people is, includes women. The highly invisible group of older people includes women. Women mm -hmm. are still most at risk in terms of risk of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and not served as well by policies like social security as they um, as they should be. So, uh, but I think the research has gotten much better. Um, Maria Arce, who's a past Art Center fellow, is wondering if you can recommend any sources or experts specifically on the intersection of COVID and issues like Alzheimer's other mental health issues facing older folks? Is there, are there any individual centers, scholarship that reporters might look at to get some ideas for their coverage or, or for sources to talk to? It's a great question. And I I'm honestly haven't seen papers coming out yet. And mm -hmm. so, I, um, so I'm not sure who to direct you to as particular people. So I, and I, if Maria wants to sort of follow up um, who sh who should she who is tracking in general mental health and covid-19 and aging kinds of stuff? is there are there particular journals or particular like where should we begin to look if we want to know about that so i think the the mental health issues are are high on the list are the loneliness issues yeah i think loneliness and isolation and their sequelae Mm -hmm. So begin to look for papers on that and see what's coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would put that first. I know the, the second issue is the issue we talked about before, which is the interaction between having a, a bad chronic disease like dementia mm -hmm. and then getting COVID and the risks that people have. So we have just a couple minutes left. Let me, uh, let me ask you a, a question that maybe connects the dots or is an opportunity to connect some dots in a certain way uh, between these seemingly disparate issues. Um, what are a few stories on public health in this period, that which, that, which is to say maybe it's about COVID-19, maybe it's about race, maybe it's about, but what are what are some stories about public health that you think need to be done? Where has there not been enough journalism to enable the public to connect the dots the way we're connecting the dots on this call? I think there are three areas. One is that the U.S. has had the worst COVID epidemic of any country. We're 4% of the, of the world's population and we have 30% of the cases. The lack of public health investment in this country and the lack of allowing public health to lead has been a big part, I believe, mm -hmm. of, of that, along with um, disastrous leadership. Um, the second is the equity issue. Um, people who are poor, people, African Americans, Latinos, have been hardest hit by COVID in addition to the groups we were talking about in nursing homes. And um, they've been hardest hit by the disease, they've been hardest hit by job loss, they've been hardest hit um, by risks of homelessness as a function of losing their income. And um, that deserves huge attention. And the third is the loneliness issue. And on all of these issues, I think we have to learn from these and build back better. On every single one of them, the lessons we learn should inform the actions we take in the future to improve everybody's well-being and protect against not just the next pandemic, but to secure a more successful society. Well, thank you. And that, that seems to me as good a place as any to um, call this a wrap. So thank you. Thank you, Linda, for spending the hour. I know you've got a lot on your plate, not only in your research, but trying to manage a public health school in the middle of a pandemic that threatens your own campus and, and students. Um, I want to thank a few folks also who, who um, 
have helped out here. Susan Kaplan is running, is accumulating the Dart Center's running tip sheet. So go to the website. You'll see not only the tips from this webinar, but the previous uh, events in this series. Uh, Ariel Richen and Kate Black from the Dart Center staff have been driving the car behind the scenes, making sure things happen. Uh, our friends at Columbia Journalism Review, who are the co-sponsors, um, will be back uh, later this week with Mark Rochester, the uh, editor-in-chief of Type Investigations, to talk about uh, covering police violence, investigating police violence um, in this period and in general. Um, come to www.dartcenter.org if you haven't already for other resources and tips. Come to our uh, social media feeds to keep up with all of this stuff. Uh, thank you all and go, go commit acts of journalism. <laughs>